Next slide, please. So it is my great pleasure to introduce the first of our, um, the first session for our policy consortium. Um, we are going to hear from, first we're gonna have a documentary about, and then we're gonna have a keynote presentation by Dr. Sylvia Amesty. Um, Dr. Amesty is a teacher, a physician, a community-based researcher, and I'll, I'll let her decide which, which order she wants to put, um, which order she wants to, um, she puts those words in, in as she identifies herself. She's at Columbia, she's in New York City, and she also works globally. Um, so I would, um, it is, thank you to, thank you to Sylvia Amesty for agreeing to join us today. And let's um, roll the documentary, please. If you ask someone, tell me about the problems in the community, maybe they will tell you the typical things that you want to hear. But when you ask someone to take a photo, they don't know what that's gonna, where that's going to take them. And when they see it and when they look at the photo and they think about why they took it, that's when they realize why they took it. So the visual is really, it's really suggestive in a very different way than, than we're used to. And I think that's why it works so well. My name is Silvia Kunto Amesti. I am a, a physician. Um, I actually work with uh, young men, young males in sexual reproductive health. But the other part of my work is, is research and is qualitative research. I'm very involved with the community. Also, I use this methodology that I have been using for a number of years uh, called PhotoVoice. I was trained for the voice in 2015. It was a, a very um, in-depth training uh, to be able to use the methodology. And this is a methodology that I really wanted to learn because I, um, I like the fact that you are just there guiding the process, but the entire research is done by actual participants. The participants are the ones who are leading uh, the themes, are leading the the issues that they see as they see them, and they actually give themselves answers, and, and, and we use that for advocacy. I'm Alani Estrella. I am a fourth year medical student, and really what brought me here, I was, I was interpreting at the time at a clinic, and a lot of the time what I saw was kind of this disconnect of kind of what patients understood and needed, especially those that were speaking Spanish. Um, from kind of like this understanding of, of, of these diseases that the doctors were treating. And I really wanted to combine everything into, into the work that I was doing. I was really interested in, in decreasing suffering for a lot of people that was unnecessary. And I kind of discovered this method, photo voice, and I started poking around. And I, I found Dr. MSD after, after some time and I told her, you know, I, I haven't been able to find anyone that's been doing this. And she was like, oh, I'm doing that. When we had the pandemic, uh, we, we, Eleni and I were thinking about what photo voice project can we do that really highlights the impact of the pandemic. And then we, we came up with a couple of projects, but then one of the projects was working with the medical students. The medical students are always a community, but it became much more of a community because they were the only ones going through it in in the in the medical school in general because the second years were still having contact with the patients first year medical school is, is super important in in one way that where that's where you meet all your classmates and you get together and you study together and and you have events together there's like things that they do together that uh they weren't able to do so in that sense it became a community that who, they didn't know each other. They didn't know each other like they should have known each other when you were in first year medical school. So that became a community. That became a real community affected by COVID. But for the students that are coming with all these desires to help others and to be, you know, doctors because they want to help other people and they have all these ideals about how they can do that. It was like a, a real shock and some for some was really even regressive. And and we thought it was worthwhile to listen to them because I think they were going through it in their own way and we knew they were gonna be okay, but it it was uh it was a moment to capture 
we felt, and, and that's why we decided to do it. Some of the most important points in my first year of medical school were when I met my first cadaver, right? And I was with other medical students and we were connecting over this, this human that donated their body to us so that we could learn. And my first patient um, who, you know, I didn't know how to interview, but they were still willing to share their story with me. And going through these pieces and growing with other people and being able to talk about it was really important in, in professional identity development and kind of how I see myself practicing with patients in the future. And all of a sudden that's gone, right? It's like people are online and you're not physically in the same space as someone. You're not necessarily connecting with someone in the same way. So it was this really unique opportunity to say, huh, this is a different time for these people, you know, this group of people. And, you know, that, that exact question of what does community look like to them? Like, how are they relating to one another right now? And, and what do they need? During the project, we ask them to take photos of a prompt. We give them a prompt and then they take photos of that prompt. They bring the photos the next day and we discuss. So it's like different waves, like five different waves of prompts. Mm -hmm. And this is the result of all of that. I took this photo about a year ago when I was in the depths of quarantining with my family. This is my sister, who I would take photos of throughout the pandemic. This photo has stuck with me because while so many parts of living through COVID have differed, this photo reminds me of not just the early months of the pandemic, but also how I'm currently living. The water is so delicately serene, and in some ways, I do feel this sense of peace and connection to my family and the people around me. But the water also produces an eerie anxiety because as it creeps up to the lips and the eyes, you're reminded of how close to drowning you are. You can feel the pressure of the water against your chest. Is it comforting or is it a somatic representation of anxiety? In this photo, I feel both, uneasy and calm. I've felt both emotions throughout the past year. The anxiety has been greater sometimes and other times the stillness and peace have been more prominent. This photo brings together those two dichotomies that have become so intertwined and textured that at times it's hard to even tell them apart. Is it the cool creep of water welcomed or feared? I absolutely think the visuals are, are, are really um, kind of unblocking, you know, and, and allowing people to express themselves. Even for those that thought uh, they don't know how to take a photo, they never have done that. We train them to, to really learn to look at photos and describe them and, and to take photos that make sense. But in, when in reality, they are the ones who, t who take all those photos and they are the ones who, who really do all the work. So in that process, we learn so much from the community and from what they're sharing with us that is like really from, from the heart. And then when, when you are the audience and you look at those photos and you look at the quotes, it also has an impact on you that is completely different from uh, just looking at the quote, for example, without the photo. I mean, that visual gets somewhere else in your brain and it really makes it, uh, highlights it. Taking a photo slows someone down in, in that you have to look at it and you have to really try to figure out what it means. And when someone's explaining why they took a photo, they become the expert. And I think it's really important for someone, even if they don't have all of the tools in making a photo look really nice or, or have the correct lighting or to be able to like really put someone in, in, the, in like a, an ideal place in a frame, being able to explain, I took this photo because I think it's important and here's why, equals that playing field, whether it's between researcher and patient or doctor and patient as they are more of a participant in that relationship. The biggest impact is that people feel empowered when they do these projects. Mm -hmm. The community feels empowered. It's important to take some respect into this process, right? We're not aiming to paint a picture in, or a community in a negative light. We're not interested in, in you know, trying to tell our own story. And so often, in, at least in the couple projects that I've worked on, I've been really surprised to find, you know, themes of hope and resiliency in really dark times. And 
it was very contrary to a lot of the reading that was that I had at the time with mm-hmm. news organizations, with other types of research. And don't get me wrong that these, you know, patient communities were affected pretty severely. Um, but often, even among all the negativity, they would talk about what they were doing together and how important it was that they had these resources, that they had each other to depend on, and that they had this moment of slowness to appreciate that. And so there are moments of beauty in these, in these projects, and I think that you have to let them breathe. Hi, everybody, and uh, so uh, happy to be here with you. Welcome to to this uh, to to the advocacy symposium. This is a wonderful opportunity to uh, share with you some of the work that I have done uh, with Photo Voice. Uh, you have seen uh, briefly an example of a project that we did with medical students, considering medical students as a community. I was actually very isolated at the time of COVID, but I would like to share with you a a project that we did with uh, with a different community, um, and uh, I'm not going to really talk very much about photo voice because you already have an idea, and I have to have uh, I would like to have time to really go through this this really uh, very Im- important project in in my mind. Uh, I was doing some work in the Dominican Republic. I have been doing some work in the Dominican Republic, and we were doing some um, actual research on uh, sexually transmitted infections in uh, key populations, meaning populations that could be more affected by it because of their vulnerability or their marginalization. So before we were doing that project, we decided to do this photo voice project with a group of, of trans women and men who have sex with men, communities in the Dominican Republic, mainly because we knew that uh, we were worried about their access to healthcare. Uh, we knew that the access to healthcare was, was limited by sometimes discrimination. Uh, we've heard a lot of stories. And we also knew, even though we didn't have the numbers uh, at that moment, that they were probably very affected by uh, sexually transmitted infections and very vulnerable to HIV. Uh, we later on found out with a quali- quantitative project that we did that some of the uh, populations and, 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 and especially the trans women could could have uh, at least 27% of new newly found infections in, in 300 uh, trans women that we tested. So that's staggering. That's a really high. So uh, this is what prompted us to do this project. Um, we use the photo voice, as, as you heard, because this is a more participatory and actual research. Um, and we wanted to actually give the voice to the participants. We wanted to learn from the participants and know what the process was in terms of what they were going through and what was happening with the community. So, um, so again, the purpose of the study then was to document through narratives and photographs the experiences of a group of participants from the trans community and the uh, men who have sex with men or MSM communities. Uh, and this was on uh, in La Romana. Uh, I'll show you um, where La Romana is. Uh, it's right in, in that circle. It's in the southeast of the Dominican Republic. It's an area where there's a lot of uh, tourism. Uh, it's a lot of movement, a lot happening in that sense. Um, and so uh, what we did is we recruited 20 participants. These actually were recruited by people in, in working with me in, in, in the clinic that I usually um, collaborate with because they were recruiters that were from the community. I, we needed help. This is a very, very hidden community in the Dominican Republic. And without their help, it would have been impossible for me to reach out to 20 uh, trans women and uh, men who have sex with men uh, to to conduct this project. So what we did, we divided the 20 participants into groups. Uh, a group of 20 is too large for photo voice. So we did two groups of 10 participants and they were ages 18 to 35. They were from all from the th- Southeast area of the Dominican Republic. 
usually what happens in those projects prior to data collection, we um, we train the participants in 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 like learning how to really talk about images we, because they need to know about image and representation. What is it that they're trying to show? We, we do a little brief uh, uh, course on photography because obviously if we want to show or express something with the image, the image has to be somewhat clear. And so that's helpful. It doesn't have to be like a, like a competition photograph, but it has to be a photograph that can show something that it makes sense in some ways. And then we also train them about ethics of photography. Uh, how, how do you apply that to, to the places and the people that you're going to photograph and how do you ask permission uh, if people are going to be identified in the photos? And this project was uh, approved by the uh, ethics committee in, in, in the Dominican Republic and also in my institution. Um, so same similar process that you heard from the video. I mean, we take photos for uh, about five days and uh, the first day is the training. Then the next day is, is, is discussing, giving them the prompt that will elicit the photo that they wanna take. Uh, the prompts go from maybe from more abstract to then narrowing down. I have to think of the prompt as I go because usually it's the participants that are kind of guide the the where we are going with this. And, and so that's uh, that's how it happens. And uh, all of the rest of the of the sessions that we do is is the prompt discussion of photos, prompt discussion of photos, until the end when they curate all the photos, they come up uh, together with the themes that what are the main themes that they discussed during the five uh, sessions that we had, and uh, and that's how uh, that is like an iterative process. That's how we do it. So we took a total of 618 images. Uh, <clears throat> then uh, we, with the discussions, we contextualize the photos. We we decided what topic we want to address, uh, and uh, I will show you, in in terms of uh, without talking too much, and <laughs> show you what we did. So um, I I will talk a little bit about the analysis of the photographs. Uh, because we follow a three-stage process usually with these projects. We select the photographs to be discussed. That is the participant that is going to select the photographs. Usually we ask them to bring three photos with narratives, uh, but they can take as many photos as they want. And then at the end, they select the, the three that they want to show the most to the group. Then they contextualize the photos during the interviews and the group sessions. Uh, that's how when we go uh, in in the in, we meet as a group, everybody brings their photos with their uh, narratives. They present it to the group, and then the group kind of dissects everybody's photos, their own and everybody else's. And then that's when the conversations about themes emerge. Um, we also use the show methods, which I'll show you here. How this this is very helpful in terms of. Um, how to uh, approach uh, an image and to analyze the image. Uh, this was a method that was used by, by Wang and Burry, so were the kind of the founders of Photo Voice. Uh, and then the show method stands for uh, see what the photograph, what do you see in the photographs? You first describe what you see objectively. Then H is for happening, what is happening in the photographs. Uh, and then the O is for our, how, how do these issues relate to our lives as a community and how do we feel about them? Why, uh, W is for why, so why have these issues arisen, arisen or an, on an individual family and societal level? Uh, the E could be for empowerment, evaluation. So we explore how we can become empowered or how can we, you know, uh, like with this understanding, what are we going to do about it is the next one, uh, is the D. So it goes uh, through like in a process for each image where we do, you know, we follow this this uh, this uh, show method. So I, I'm going to tell you what the themes, the themes that came out, I will be brief with the themes because 
I'm going to focus on the last three and essentially mainly on the last one. Uh, but when, when they started talking about uh, the photos and the first photos they bring, and I don't know why this happens in a lot of the groups, you, 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 you give them a very abstract prompt and people always, you know, for some reason talk about what's happening in the environment, like there's trash everywhere or, or this is affecting us, it's affecting everybody. So they talk about themes that affect communities in general. It's not anything particular to that community, but it's kind of the entry point. They start talking about those things a little by little. And uh, then they they started talking more about poverty that affects them because a lot of the times, uh, especially in the trans women community, they uh, many of them had uh, stopped school because of the bullying and then they can't find jobs because uh, you know, because of the discrimination against that population. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult. Sometimes they, they did talk a lot about, well, that was all that's left for me is to really do sex work. And so that was a, a big, um, one of the big discussions that we had. So I'm going to start showing you some pictures, uh, and I'll start, I'll jump just right to the street work one, actually poverty. There's one poverty. Um, we have one of our participants who um, used to work as a shoe shining boy, and he 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 actually talked a lot about this, how it feels different to who to what happens to him now in terms of who he is, because uh, he said uh, in the quote, "I remember when I worked shining shoes in the park to help out my mother at home. It's very difficult for me to talk about this. People humiliated me and treated me poorly." which in a way is, is very similar to how uh, this participant was feeling uh, with his, you know, having his identity as an MSM or a trans woman. So uh, it, he, he, this was an image of how um, for him, that was very difficult for him to talk about and to share with us. Um, let me see, I can't, okay. Uh, then we're, no, I'm going to show you a, a photo about the street work that they were talking about. And this is actually one of our participants. Um, she was, uh, uh, in the, in the street that she was like a sex workers and she worked in, essentially in the streets, like uh, hailing people, uh, in an area of La Romana where, where, you know, where that's expected, like any other city or, or, or town that you can imagine those things happen. Uh, and then she she had this uh, says quote for here. It says, I'm going to work and I'm asking for a ride. One time someone asked me if I was a woman or a man. I told him I was trans to avoid problems. One has to be honest and not lie. And where that comes from is that we were really talking about this, this issue of uh, uh, of lying to people. And she was mentioning that she had a friend that was doing what she was doing right now, got in a car. Uh, the the person who who picked her up thought she was a, a woman, like a like a uh, like a cis female. And when he realized that uh, that she was trans, uh, she he took a machete and and attacked her and started you know like and cut her everywhere. And then she had to run in and take her to the hospital. So this is why she was saying that. Um, this is uh, another photo of another one of our participants uh, that uh, discussed the family uh, theme when they were talking about families. And this is a uh, 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 men who have sex with men. He had a, a male partner and uh, they lived together uh, but their families were, you know, not really very accepting of this. So he took this photo and, uh, which reminded him of his childhood and what he did when he was sad and unhappy. And he says, when I was a small child and my father hit me, I would go to the backyard. I would take care of the plants like a relief. I have many plants in my house now, and I take care of them. This is our house, our home. When I come home, um, home tired from the day, our home is for me like an oasis. So imagine like this is is triggering all these memories of how he was dealing with the pain 
of like, you know, having a, a difficulty with his father or having an argument or being rejected or being punished. So this is really very important. But now let's move on to during these discussions, they decided that they really wanted to focus mainly on discrimination as a topic. And, and, and this is what I'm going to show now. I'm going to show a bunch of pictures uh, that they, they chose uh, that were very, uh, you know, like telling of that discrimination that they suffer. They spoke about many, many types of discrimination. And, uh, but I'll, I'll show you the photos and let them speak for themselves. So in this quote, we have the participant looking in uh, uh, like a basketball court. And he says, I feel like if I wanted to play basketball with the other guys, I couldn't because I'm gay and I'm not accepted by them. I do not have the freedom like they do to go there to exercise there. Then they also discuss a lot of the discrimination that they suffer from the church and from uh, from religious institutions. So actually, that this was a very large, very big theme for a lot of them. And so there are going to be a few pictures of this. Um, this is the first one. This is a church that you can see in that photo. And the quote, uh, the participant will say, most of us feel discriminated by the church, by the pastors and religious leaders. Sometimes we gather and meet in this area outside of the church. We are treated like leopards. If I go to the service, they all get up and walk away. They go somewhere else. This is another church photo and another quote. They gather inside the church. We gather outside in front of the church. One more church photo, because they took a lot of these, and they actually had a lot to say about this. Um, and this participant says, I went to church one day, and I sat in one of the regular benches. I was told I could not sit there because that bench was reserved. I always thought you could sit wherever you wanted to, which is, you know, this is very telling for them. Um, then they will show discrimination. Uh, we're talking about now a healthcare system. They were trying to uh, discuss like or talk about how they feel discriminated uh, when they access healthcare, um, and so they took this photo of like a waiting room in a clinic, and uh, one of the participants uh, quoted about this photo says, "Bring the shotgun. We're going to kill ducks," which in 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 Dominican in Spanish it means faggot, and in, you know in a very despective language. Uh, and sometimes they say, sometimes even the doctors say that. Sometimes people say that when they see us, also the doctors. So you can imagine how how the participants feel uh, going to healthcare or accessing care. It was like they probably would have to be very sick or even try not to go at all because they felt like they were not welcome. Uh, this is uh, about this uh this um his, his story that i was telling you about the trans woman that was uh that was um uh, attacked with the machete um the same person took the photo and says a trans friend of mine received a machete injury in her hands and many doctors would not touch her doctors refuse to help her doctors treat me poorly i feel like they do not treat me like they treat others And then uh, they also talk about discrimination from the police force in, 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 in many ways. This is a, uh, a, uh, like a park in Santo Domingo where a lot of the LGBT community gather. And usually, or, or not all the time, but sometimes you just have a lot of policemen there and they always wonder if it's because they are there. Uh, in this photo, and the quote says, one observes the excessive amount of police force officers in the park where the LGBT community gathers, a show of power. Then same park say, you just come to the park and if you are different, they put their eyes on you. Same park and same person. Even though we feel threatened, 
we will not rest until we have our place. This is more uh, almost uh, one of the final photos. I have one more. Um, and this uh, participant uh, was talking about his neighborhood and he, he said, I did an experiment in my neighborhood. My friend had the camera and I asked him to take pictures of neighbors reactions while I was walking by. And you just have, can see what the image says. And the picture uh, speaks more than a thousand words here. Um, so I, at the end, we have like a reflection and the participants, uh, you really talk about the project and how they felt. And uh, I wanted to read this to you because this is what they said about the project and how they felt about it and how they feel in general with all this discrimination happening. So I'll read it for you. Photo voice is a way to project with a little more reach our voices so that people learn really the issues our community has from the inside. It is a play based on real life events in which each one of us exposes how much of a good or a bad time we go through in all of this. To narrate the story in pictures leads us to reflect that the world truly has been most of the time unjustly cruel with us. This is one of the best ways, photo voice, so that people learn and become sensitized around this topic. There are too many people that attack us because of our lack of because of lack of knowledge. When we talk about talent, we have plenty of it. When we talk about efforts, we also have a surplus of that. All that dedication that we put into everything we do, we owe in part to them, those who discriminate against us, because when they make things so difficult for us, they challenge us to go out in the streets and like a lion we show society that we can roar too, that we too have the strength to go onward. One last photo from one of my participants. I would like to be on that plane escape. I would like to be free like everyone else. Thank you very much for your attention and for being here with us. Thank you, Sylvia. That really was remarkable. And I think it's something that very few of us, both in terms of the community you work with and the, the, the uh, approach you use, I think that's really new ground for, for most of us. It certainly is for me. I also want to thank you for allowing us to come with our cameras and interrupt your life and, uh, and, and for sharing the beautiful uh, Columbia Medical School Library with us. Um, we're a little short on time, but I do want to ask you one question. Um, you're a clinician and you're going into these communities in a country you don't live in, in a world that you don't necessarily live in. How do you balance your clinical impulses, your need to fix things and take care of people with the observing and listening to them? How does that, how does that work for you? Well, it's a good question. You learn that to fix things you need to learn and you need to hear, you need to listen. And, uh, otherwise you don't fix very much if you don't know what you're trying to fix it's it's much more complex than just having a pole or or having diabetes or you know usually people's lives are very complex and one more what surprised you the most about the work that you did with the group in the dominican republic what was the thing that really you didn't expect and you found it to be just really compelling i was very moved by by the amount of suffering that they were going through and yet they were so resilient and they were so uh positive and they 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 were ready to move on they like when we did this project they were like yeah let's 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 show everybody these photos and actually we have done some talks with these photos and it's been very controversial because people uh really uh, it's it's a difficult topic to address in anywhere in not not different in the Dominican Republic, but uh, I was surprised that uh, that the project highlighted a lot of the things they go through, and like they say, they realize really much more what they go through. But how empowered they became uh, 
with understanding that that happens and it happens because people do not really understand them that people are discriminating against them is not so much something that uh it, it's it's on them you know it's more on everybody else who are not really understanding the community in that sense so i was i was very surprised by that thank you sylvia and thank you so much for your time and for sharing your work with us uh it's really i, I said i've been around for quite a while and i I can still be inspired by by things, and, and this has been very inspiring for me. So thank you so much for joining us and contributing today. Thank you for having me.